All right. So today we're going to talk about energy bar charts, which is a chance to continue to talk about the different types of energy. And so we'll have just some introductory information here about the different kinds of energy, and then we'll get to the bar charts themselves. So one way to, to answer these questions in terms of what has more energy is to think about what would what would hurt more if it hit you. So what has more energy, baseball moving at five miles per hour or 100? Obviously, well, hopefully, obviously, one at 100 miles per hour. Um, what has more energy, a dump truck or a baseball? Both moving at the same speed, the dump truck does. What has more energy, a baseball moving at you at 100 miles an hour or a dump truck at one mile per hour? Hmm. Well, that, that's harder to answer because the baseball has uh, the, the higher speed, but the dump truck has the greater mass. So that one, we can't be sure. All right, what kind of energy are we thinking about? And it is kinetic energy. And the equation is on your equation sheet, one half mv squared. All right, so it involves the mass and the velocity. Those are those things we we're talking about and thinking about up there. All right, so the more mass something has, the more energy, the more speed something has the more energy and I say speed even though it's a v here because we're squaring it so the direction is completely unimportant in this equation it's really just how fast the magnitude all right what has more energy a brick that's held one foot above your head or a pebble which one's going to hurt more brick will why because it has more mass all right what if we hold the brick 10 feet above your head instead of one foot. Does that have more energy when it's held 10 feet above your head? Well, it's not moving in either case, okay? But it has energy stored in it. And the higher we hold it up, the more energy it has stored in it. And so the brick held 10 feet above your head is gonna have more energy. Okay, a brick held five feet above your head or a cinder block held one foot above your head. Well, you might not know what a cinder block is. It's a building material, and when we're in the classroom, we can just point to the wall because the walls are made of cinder blocks. It's, you can just think of it as a large brick. It's many times larger than a regular brick. And so this is a case where we're not sure. Oh, sorry about that. Because we don't know how much more mass the the cinder block has, but it has more mass, but it's not as high, so we're not sure. So we're talking about gravitational potential energy here. I'll just abbreviate, I think people are comfortable with that. And the equation for gravitational potential energy is simply mgh. So this is weight, and so the more weight something has, the the more gravitational potential energy it has and the higher it is. Okay, now this height is measured to some relative to some reference line. And so, you know, if you have a roller coaster and all kinds of fun stuff, we could measure this compared to say the lowest point in the ride. We could say that is where we're going to measure it from. We could measure it from the ground. Okay, which is not necessarily where the lowest point in the line in the ride is. We could measure it relative to the center of the earth. That's not a good choice. I mean, it's fine, but like just the numbers get really big. But it's, it's relative to some place. And if you watch my videos that I've posted in the module that I made, you'll see that this reference line, it's really unimportant as long as we, as long as we do pick it, it doesn't matter where it is, I should say. It is super important. But it doesn't matter where it is, as long as we pick it, and then we use that when we're calculating both the initial and final. And so we'll, we'll see that more as we go. All right, what has more energy, a ball sitting in a spring that's not compressed or one that is compressed? And if we think back to our projectile motion lab, we have experience with this. And so if the ball is just sitting in there, the spring's not compressed, there's no energy. 
And so if it is compressed, that's when it has more energy. This would be like the number of clicks. So if you if you push it in there and into the launcher and it clicks once or clicks twice or clicks three times, this would be like once and this would be like three times. That's going to have more energy. It's going to come out of there faster. Again, this is not energy of motion. This is stored up energy, potential energy. What if we compress it the same amount, but we have a strong spring in one launcher and a weak spring in the other? Obviously, the strong spring is going to matter, is going to give it more energy. Okay, again, it's not moving, but we know that there's the potential for this one against the strong spring to do more damage, so get it going faster. So again, we're talking about potential, but this is spring potential energy. It's also called elastic energy, but usually in this course, we just call it spring potential energy. Okay, so we have two kinds of spring potential energy. I'm sorry, we have two kinds of potential energy. One is PEG that we did on the last slide, and this one is PES. This is one half K delta X squared, where delta X is measured relative to the rest position of the spring. So you can either compress it or stretch it. All these examples up here were compressing, but if you stretch it, it also gives um, additional energy. All right. So went through hopefully give you a little bit of a feel for those types of energy if you didn't already have that. And one of the things that is in this, that we do constantly in the analysis in these problems in this unit is deciding if an object has energy. And so those questions that were on the last slides, those, those give you a sense of like how much, but uh, more simply than that, we need to decide if an object has energy, has that type of energy or not but at a particular time. So we need to understand that particular time period. And then we can decide if it has energy. And then the questions that we ask are, are relatively straightforward. So for gravitational potential energy, we talked about that, that place where, where we pick where PEG is equal to zero. And we're gonna represent that as a dashed line somewhere in our picture. And we'll put a dashed line and we'll say PEG equals zero. And so all your question has to be is, is the object above this line? Okay, so if it was on that roller coaster, a little mini roller coaster here, you know, if you're right there, then yes, it has gravitational potential energy. If it's here, yes, it has gravitational potential energy. If it's anywhere above that line. If it's on the line, then the answer is no. That's easy. And I just realized this G doesn't look very good. There we go, that's a G. All right, spring potential energy. At the current time, is the object sitting up against, hanging from, or attached to a spring that is compressed or stretched? You will find that in many of the problems, there's no spring whatsoever. If there's no spring, that makes it easy. Then there's no spring potential energy. If the object has been launched and is going across the room and it's not touching the spring, then there's no spring potential energy at that time. Okay, so you have to think about when are we analyzing? And so just as important as these questions is deciding on what your initial and your final are. Okay, that's what's most important is really understanding what is my initial state? Where is the thing at that initial state? And where is my final state? Because only once you really understand what your initial and final states are, do these questions make sense? or can you accurately answer them, I guess I should say. Kinetic energy, that's the easiest one. Is the object moving or not? And so you're gonna be asking yourself these questions again about the initial time frame and the final time frame. And we'll have to come back to this, and you'll see this in all the examples, but the initial and final times can be as far apart as you want. And so if you have a roller coaster, and we've got point A and B and C and D and E and F, G, H. We can pick our initial state to be A and our final state to be G. We don't have to, we don't have to solve the problem as let, let's do this analysis where this is initial and this is final. And then let's do this analysis where B is initial and C is final. And then let, that takes forever. Because if 
if you know information about A and you want to find out information about G, then just do the analysis from A to G. There's no reason to, to, to worry about B, C, D, all those other points. We can make those as far apart as we want. Okay, that's for chapter seven. We'll see once, once we get to chapter eight and we're studying momentum, well then that, that's gonna, there's gonna be a different way that we talk about how we should pick initial and final. But for chapter seven, energy, pick any points as far apart as we want. All right, so here's one of those energy bar charts. So we've got, um, we're gonna do six of these. Well, we may not because of, of time. I don't wanna take up too much time. I'm aiming for 15 to 20 minutes for these lessons. So it's possible one of, some of these will be done tomorrow. So we've got a skateboarder who is at rest at the top of a frictionless ramp. So I'll draw a picture. I don't know what just happened there. Um, but the skateboarder is right here right on the edge okay at rest and if we're trying to find her speed at the bottom of the ramp then all right so if she starts here and she slides down and goes up and back okay she goes up and then she comes back and I don't know what happened to my dot there and so in this case we would probably call this our initial and this point down here, our final. And then draw a dashed line right through there. And we can say that is PEG equals zero. Now we could have drawn this, this ramp, you know, might be, you know, might be a few feet off the ground. And so the actual ground might be down here. We could have drawn this dashed line down there, but it's actually simpler if we pick right here. And we'll, we'll understand that better as we do more calculations. All right, so initial, what's the initial? Does it have kinetic energy? In other words, is it moving? No, so I'll just put a zero there. Does it have gravitational potential energy? In other words, is it above this dashed line? Is this above the dashed line? Well, yes, so it has some gravitational potential energy. I'm just picking some random amount there. I did one, two, three, four, five lines. Put a little five in there. Okay, and so whatever amount you you put there would be fine. Does this skateboarder have spring potential energy? Well, definitely not. There's no springs anywhere involved in a skateboard and a ramp. So no and no. All right. Kinetic energy. Does the skateboarder, I'm sorry, now we're on to final. So. Does the skateboarder have kinetic energy when she's here? Okay, well, that's just a point. It's like, well, is she sitting still there? No, because remember, she's skating down and back and forth and back and forth. Okay, so let's just take it for the first time. She goes down this, it's really steep. She gets to there, of course she's moving. She's going to have some kinetic energy there. So we're going to have to include that. I don't know how much yet. And then does she have gravitational potential energy? Is she above this point? I'm sorry, is this point above this dashed line? The answer is no. Okay. Now work by non-conservative forces, that's a little bit trickier, but if we, if we look at her and we say, as she's somewhere along the ramp, there's a normal force and there's weight. Now weight is conservative A normal force is non-conservative. So I don't need to worry about the weight because it's a conservative force. And I'm trying to figure out the, the work. This is a capital W here. Okay, it's a lowercase w. So I don't need to worry about the weight because it's conservative. I only need to worry about the normal force. Okay, and at any given point, I'll draw a work diagram for, for this normal force. At any given point, the normal force is perpendicular to the displacement. Okay, this is a work diagram. And if you look through, watch my videos, you'll, you'll see the instructions on how to draw a work diagram. And the angle between these is 90 degrees. And what that means is that the normal force is not doing any work. 
because this force times d times the cosine of 90 degrees. Well, cosine of 90 is zero. Okay, so that's gonna make this zero. Now our conservation of energy equation, if you have your equation sheet handy, take a look at it. There's a seven term equation. We looked at it yesterday. And the left side of this equation has these terms. These four terms are on the left side of the equation. And then these three terms are on the right side of the equation. So these four things have to add up to these three things. And so if these are zero here, then this one is gonna have to be five. Okay, so it's a pretty boring energy bar chart, but it's saying there's none of this, or this, or this, or this, or this. And the only thing is we have gravitational potential energy and it completely turns into kinetic energy. And so that's the story on that one. All right, now that we've got established that the work by non-conservative forces for the skateboarder is zero, the analysis can be a little bit easier. All right, we've got our skateboarder, or I'm sorry, we've got our ramp. We'll define the gravitational potential energy to be zero here again. And the skateboarder was at rest up here. And then they've gone down and they're one third of the way up the other side. So maybe like right, like right there. Okay, so does the skateboarder have kinetic energy initially? No. Do they have gravitational potential energy? Yes, one, two, three, four. I'm just going to draw this the same as on the last slide because it's the same scenario. So I'm going to be consistent with that. And then there's no springs involved in this. All right. When she gets to here, is she moving? Yes, she's moving. She, we expect her to go all the way back up to the same height as she started, but over here. So yeah, she has some kinetic energy. How much? I don't know. All right. Does she have gravitational potential energy? Remember, the question is, is she above this dashed line? Yes, she's above the dashed line. So we're going to have some gravitational potential energy. And there's no spring. So I just started these lines, but then we can draw them in. What do I think she has more of? Does she have more kinetic energy or more potential? Hmm. Well, she's only one third as high as she is there. So that makes me think that she has a lot less potential energy at the final state than she did at the initial state. And so I'll just draw that as two bars. And then, well, how high should this be? Can I just draw this kinetic energy any amount that I want? No, because this total has to equal this total. So if this is five, then this has to be five. So two plus what equals five? You got it, three. All right, so and these are, you know, there's no scale here, but we're just doing relative amounts. If there was five units of energy before, there need to be five units of energy afterward. Okay, we have a paper airplane and it's getting thrown. So somebody's standing here holding the paper airplane and then they throw it and it lands on the floor over there. All right. Oh, and then it slides five feet. There we go. All right, so we are supposed to analyze it from just after the throw. That's our initial. So not while it's in my hand, but just after the throw until just after it lands on the floor. So like not right, not right there, like right there. That's my final. Okay, so initially, is it moving? No, well, some people might say, no, it's not moving because you're holding it. However, we defined our initial state to be just after the throw. So yes, it does have kinetic energy because it's moving. 
So you gotta be really careful about how you define these. All right, does it have gravitational potential energy? Well, we didn't draw a dashed line to represent the gravitational potential energy. I do have a dashed line there. We need one that's gonna represent our gravitational potential energy. It's a horizontal line and There it is. And so is this point, is the airplane above this line? And the answer is yes. Okay, so it has some amount of gravitational potential energy. How much? I, I don't know. I can't really decide which of these to make bigger. There's no spring. I don't need to worry about that. And then, well, let's just go ahead and make a decision. I'll just go ahead and say it's less. So I'll say three there and two there, but I don't, those could go either way. All right. And then over here, we look at the airplane afterward. I'm going to come back to this work term. After the plane has landed on the floor, okay, it has not yet come to a stop. So it still has some kinetic energy. Okay, it does not have gravitational potential energy. And we could say that during this, so, so this is the only part that's gonna be here in the final, so we need to decide how big to make it. And so we could say, well, during this time, what, could have, what forces could have been acting on the airplane? Well, there could have been air resistance acting. Okay, we drew a free body diagram. Could have been air resistance acting on the airplane during anywhere during its flight, and there was weight. Okay, now this one is a non conservative force, so we're going to draw a work diagram. So there was the force of air resistance, and which way was it going? Well, let's say this was for shortly after when it left. So its displacement was that way. So the angle between those is 180 degrees. And if we do work equals FD cosine 180 degrees. Sorry about those lines. Sometimes those just appear. I haven't figured out why. But cosine of 180 degrees, that is negative one. So we're gonna have negative work. At any point along here, the air resistance is always acting opposite the object's displacement. And so there's some amount of negative work. It's taking energy out of the system. So now we can look at this. So that's five minus one here. So that's four. So that means over here, we need to have four units of energy left. There we go. And now the initial energy plus the work term equals the final energy. And again, that matches up to what's on your um, equation sheets. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the video here.